this building. Lead us. Guide us, Lord Jesus. As we receive encouragement, victory, peace, and joy from you, God. We thank you for it, Jesus. You're good to us. And we love you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. How many is expecting something today in the Lord? How many woke up this morning and said, this is a day God's going to do something great for me? Now, you might not have said it vocally, but how about in your spirit? Maybe when you drove into the parking lot. Maybe when you walked into the building. Maybe there's a part of us that, as John did in the bosom of Elizabeth, when they met Jesus in the bosom of Mary. Proximity of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is a day that God is going to do something great for somebody if you'll let him. I want to present anybody that will let Jesus do something for you.
just lift our hands and let's just say, Lord Jesus, I worship you, God. I magnify you, Jesus.
And I'm thrilled that the presence of the Lord is in this place here today. Now we have some prayer requests. God knows what the prayer requests are. We're not going to read them. Uh, there's a lady that has attended our church. I don't exactly know how to pronounce her last name. It's Fitcher, something like that. She's uh, in fourth stage cancer. She's been sent home. Uh, and the family's called and asked us to pray for her. And also, um, Sister Palmer, it's not Palmer, uh, has a cane, sits right back in here. Is it Palmer? Nobody's helping me. Okay. Turn, that's it, turn. And she, I don't know what happened, she went into the hospital, I got a call from her today, and she's in a rehab center right now, and asked us to pray for her. Just hold those prayer requests up, would you, brother? Here's a bunch of prayer requests, people have needs, and God knows who they are. Let's just pray for all those that are sick or in trouble or whatever the problem is, let's pray for them together. Take somebody by the hand and be sincere. Lord, in the name of Jesus, pray for Paula Turner. And pray for the fixture lady that's been here and in trouble. God, touch all the needs. Heal the sick. Heal those who are sick. In the name of Jesus.
said in Revelation, he said, if any man hear my voice, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, which tells us when he said he was knocking, it's his voice called. And he said, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and we'll sup with him. That's called intimate fellowship. So you can block him and not answer the door and pretend he's not knocking. Why would you come to church and do that? Why did you come? <laughs> you knew he was going to show up. <laughs> he's so good, isn't he? Yeah. Can we give him a little more praise for just a minute? Father and mother. 
And this young man answered, and he said unto him, Master, all these things, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, would you read this with me? And I'm just going to want to emphasize a couple of words here. Would you read it with me? Then Jesus, beholding him. Hold on right there. When this man answered the question, I've kept these from my youth up. Jesus refocused. And he beheld him. That means he was seeing the real person, not just the facade. And he saw potential. And he said, and then it says, he loved him. Does that mean he didn't love him before? No. He turned on the love vibes. He expressed love in his emotions. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. He saw potential. He beheld it. He saw what he could be for the kingdom. He loved it. And it showed him just one thing he needed to do. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Verse 22. And he was sad at that sin. He was just offered treasures in heaven. He was just offered fellowship with the God of eternity. And he was sad. He was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. It tore him up. It created conflict within his soul. My riches, eternal riches. Me by myself, me with God. I gotta give up this to have that. It's very conflicting and polarizing. And he went away. Jesus, verse 23, looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? It's hard for people that trust in riches enter the kingdom of God. And his, his verse 24, his disciples were astonished at his word, but Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? I'll tell you this, he sort of said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now those of you that were with us Friday and Saturday, don't tune out when I tell you my title. I want to talk about shift. Shift. There's a shift taking place in this room here today. Similar to what happened with this rich young woman. Father, I honor you, bless you, I'm so thankful for your presence. You're an awesome God. You've manifested your love. You have beheld us today. You've looked into every heart on this property. The children, the teachers, staff, the ushers, the hostesses, the saints of God. Yes, you have beheld and measured everyone, including 
us and you've loved us when your flow your presence began to sweep between these pews and up and down the aisles you're saying I love you I love you he beheld you beheld us and you loved us and we're thankful for that and you are inviting us to a shift and I'm so excited about it. We started it. Third Friday night. Lord, we want to continue to that shift. We love you and honor you. Bless the people of God. You may be seated and would you please say, let this sink into your ears. And that part of 
of us that wants to be in control conflicts with God's desire to be in control. And growth and maturity comes when we get mature enough to disown someone. That's why many Christians are uh, stuck, dry, bump around from church to church to church to church because they think the problem is the church when the problem is right here. You've got too much control and you're not getting in the flow and you're not growing. And it's everybody else's fault. And so, take deny yourself. Now the end goal, the end result is following. And he's saying, unless you do one and two, you can't follow me. Because you own yourself. And if I say turn left, you won't turn left. If I say turn right, you won't turn right. If I say let's fast or let's do this, you won't want to do it because you didn't disown yourself. You're still in control. You still call the shots instead of saying, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And so, take up, he said, deny yourself and take up your cross. What does that mean? Take up my cross. Jesus said this to the rich young ruler, take up your cross, before he'd been on a cross. The cross, everybody in Israel knew what the cross was. The cross was the means of capital punishment from the Romans. They were brutal. And the Romans, when they wanted to execute you, they didn't take you to a guillotine. They didn't give you a shot. They put you on a cross. It was a miserable way to die. And it took a long time to die. And now Jesus says, and he, he tells, it's sort of like, you know, as I've said before, the electric chair. He could have said, if he was in our day, deny yourself and take up your electric chair. Carry it around. Carry around your electric chair. So anytime you feel like getting in, con in control and, and disobeying God, you can give yourself a zap and kill yourself again so you can keep following Jesus because you cannot really be a Jesus follower with you being in control because you're going to argue, you're going to fight, you're going to resist, you're going to put your ears, your fingers in your ears because you're going to be in control. That's why there has to be a defining moment a defining moment and many defining moments where you and God work it out where he helps you give up and give in to him. We're talking about discipleship. Being a disciple. Because you can be a believer and not a disciple. You can be saved and not a disciple. Because it's one thing getting saved it's another thing growing up. It's called sanctification. God saves us and he sanctifies us if we let him. And sanctified means set apart. The word literally means to set apart for God's use. That means before he can use us, he's got to clean up some stuff. He's got to change some attitudes. He's got to get us on the right path. He can't be, he can't use us if we're out of control. Right? So he works on our will. You with me? I'm teaching good. He works on our will to help us subordinate to him. Because the only way we can ever really be happy is being in his control, not our control. Amen. Notice how well you were doing before you came to Jesus when you were totally in control. The safest place you can be 
is to be subordinate and submit to God so that I have his benefits, I have his grace, I have his power, I have his protection, I have his providence, I have all of his glory, but I've got to submit to him. You see, some people want to, don't want to be owned by God, but they want to die and go to heaven. You can't go to heaven if you're not owned. You've got to get owned. Which means you have to surrender. There's something, you know, inside of us, our will, our flesh, it's called in the Bible, our human nature that just wants to hang on. It's desperate to stay in control. That's why we have to go to a cross also. Easy, easy believism isn't going to get you anywhere. I believe, praise the Lord, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Probably not. <laughs> Don't get fooled by signing a card or shaking a preacher's hand or repeating somebody's prayer. You've got to have an encounter yes. with God. Some defining moment that thus doesn't just change how you think, but changes your heart and changes your being, and you're no longer the same that you were before you had that encounter. Take up, deny yourself, disown yourself. This is not popular preaching. This is not what your human flesh wants to hear today. You want to hear about your season of blessing. <laughs> that was in a skit last night. You want to hear about prosperity. That's what you want to hear. You want to, he's either going to be your God or he just isn't going to be. No wonder preachers don't preach this stuff. All right. Because that's what Jesus preached to that rich young ruler. He was saying, he beheld him. He was a sincere guy. He came to Jesus with a sincere question. What do I need to do? Keep the commandments. Jesus quoted the commandments. It was kind of funny last night. One of the one of the little games we played is who can name all the commandments. The highest we got was five. <laughs> I told them at the, at the beginning of the new year I'm starting a tenth commandment Bible lesson series. It'll probably take all year to get through. <laughs> it was funny. And so. He speaks to this young man about the commandments and the, and, and the young man says, Lord, I've done that all for my whole life. I'm serious, man. I like I did it. I'm doing it. And Jesus beheld him. He saw potential. He saw sincerity. But there was one thing. There was a problem. He loved He also loved self. He loved self. He really thought he was cutie pie. Mr. Q. And he loved himself. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money is the root. The love of and when Jesus beheld him, yes. he loved him yes. like we were loved here today yes. and are still being loved, by the way. Yes. If God loves you, he's going to tell you the truth. Yes. If a preacher loves you, he's going to tell you the truth. Yes. If he loves your money, he ain't going to tell you the truth. And so he beholds him 
and he loves him, and he's saying, man, there's only one, one more thing. One more thing. When God shows you a thing, what do you do? When God shows you a thing, He shows you something that's standing between you and Him having a deeper, more enriching relationship. He'll show you a thing. And right then, you've got more power than you can ever imagine. When God shows you a thing, He puts unbelievable power and authority into your hands because it's your choice. You have the power of choice when he shows you a thing. And when he shows you a thing, he's going to be there to help you overcome that thing. But first, your will has to submit it's got to be, I like this, I love this, but I love you more. I uh, wish somebody could get that. Because when God shows you a thing, he's trying to see and help you see. Who do you love the most? What do you love the most? And there's things in our lives we don't even know are there. And you will never know until God speaks to you about your thing. And now you have a choice. This thing. When you come to that point, that thing is now an issue. When God shows you a thing, that thing is now an issue. And how you respond to that thing is going to determine your future. Had that man done the right thing with this thing, who knows what he could have become? I personally think, it's my own personal, personal opinion, that Jesus was inviting him into an inner circle. He beheld him. He loved him. He saw his potential. And he said, well, there's this, this thing. That thing, having money wasn't the thing. God didn't ask him to sell the money because God hates money. He caught a few fish to get some money. Paid taxes with. Pulled coins out of their mouth. It was his attitude about the money. As a matter of fact, I have a sort of a hunch. I don't know if it's right or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. God does a lot of things that surprise me. But I wouldn't be surprised if the man started writing a check, clearing out his, all of his accounts, and brought it to him in a wheelbarrow. I want to follow you. I love you. If this is what i got to do, this is what I've done. It wouldn't surprise me if the Lord said, keep it. Because in your heart, you did it. Now, I bless you back with it. That's what he did to uh, Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham was ready to come down, God said, oh, I just want to know. Now, I know. So in the beholding and in the loving, God is weighing this man's spirit. And God was offering him a shift. If you answer this right, your whole life is going to shift. And you're going to be walking in your destiny. I'm offering you, sir, a shift to get you on your road for destiny. Or you'll just sort of slip away. There was a lot on the line. 
And when God shows you a thing, He's going to say. And He's offering you a shift. And when that shift takes place, because you submit and you put Him first, your life is radically going to change because you're devoiding of yourself, yourself. My love for money, I'm surrendering it to you. I don't have it anymore. Thank God. Now there's more space for God to work in his life. If you have a desire for God to use you, ask God to show you what's standing between you and your destiny. And guess what's going to happen? He's going to show you a thing. He's going to isolate it, put it in front of you, and you won't like it. Because when God shows you you, it's embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. You mean I've been like this all this time? Yes. And you love me anyway? Yes. You're kidding, right? I'm sorry. I repent. I don't want it. I want you. And whatever I got to do, I'll do. Because I want you and I want more of you. That's how we grow. And when you shift through obedience, then he said, come follow me. So the shifting takes place in the changing of priorities. I don't me, it's a weight in my life. It's hindering my spiritual life. It's hindering my relationship with God. It's standing between me and my destiny. And my destiny is much more important to me than this thing. And if I give God the thing, then God's going to shift my world. And I'm now walking closer to my destiny. He couldn't do it. He got sad. He grieved. Let's look at this word shift in our next slide and look at the definitions. And I thank all of you that were with us yesterday and all being patient with me. To move. Would you read it with me? To move from one place, position, or direction to another. To move. To go from where you are to where he'd like you to be. Or change direction. Following him. Isn't that what he said? Yes. Come follow me. I want you to change direction now. Yes. And I want you right here by my side. Yes. What an opportunity. Oh, Jesus. What a moment. Yes. But as the message Bible says in Matthew or Mark chapter 10. Excuse me. Yeah. It's that next. Where am I at? I'm sorry. You know, oh yeah, I'm repeating it here. In Mark 10, 20, he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth up. And then Jesus loved him, beheld him. Next slide, 13. And he was sad. He was sad. Everybody say he was sad. That's why some of you lost your joy in this service. You had some, you lost it. Because I'm talking about the price. And you're sad about that. You want me to talk about prosperity? You want me to talk about your season? Or whatever. But when we get, when God speaks to us about things, we get sad because we love our things. Then Jesus looked around and about and saith to the disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Well, don't, don't say, I'm not rich. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. You're rich with things. Doesn't have to be money, honey. 
It can be pride. It can be illicit sexual activity. Sins. You know what? If you buy into once saved, always saved, that's a trick down the path to hell. Because if you think you can sin all you want to and you're still saved, you are deceived. Because nothing's going to enter into that place with a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing. So God gave him an invitation to shift. Wow. The Message Bible says this. Watch this. Jesus looked him hard in the eye. When the man said, I've kept this all my life. I used to be, I'm a good boy. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. He said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth then will then be heavenly wealth and come follow me. Man, how did you miss that? All your wealth is going to be heavenly wealth. This wealth is going to pass away. Your, your coin collection is going to rot. Your, your, your little dineros or whatever is so important to you, it's going to burn up. Don't be sitting around lavishing your riches because it ain't going to last, bro. You ought to give it up because you can have heavenly wealth. But you can't have heavenly wealth loving things more than you love God. And there becomes the problem. Because if you love something more than you love God, that's an idol in your life. Am I making you sad or am I making you glad? If you're getting sad, you're on the wrong side of the equation. Because people that have the right priority, when God shows them something they can change and shift more into their destiny, they're happy about it. They're glad to see it because they value the heavenly more than the earthly. Let's give God high praise right now. Give God praise until you feel glad. Church you can go to. He'll, 
You know who's going to be there when you get there? You. There's the problem. He did not commit himself unto them because he knew it was the wrong thing that was driving them. They wanted the loaves and the fishes, and there was no commitment. Is it possible that God has blessed us with so many things, but yet he's still not very committed to us? Is it possible to get a little mixed up that I got a blessing? That must mean I got straight A's on my spiritual report card. By the way, Brother Chris Pope is here today. We've been praying for you. And it's good to see you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there's a shift that's already happened. That God is inviting you to join in. But there is something he's going to say about the thing. And the thing can stand between you and God. And when that happens, now that thing is an issue. When God shows you a thing, it's an invitation. But if you reject the invitation, it would be bad to have more of Jesus. Well, it's the prize. I have to have less. Lots of affirmation. Amen. When I'm not getting it, I'm humble enough to pay it for it. <laughs> you know what's funny about that? They think I'm kidding. <laughs> and so, he loved Israel, but they rejected it. They wouldn't go with the shift, changing from one place to another or one position to another, or one direction to another. And so for 40 years, they went out there. And you know what? Gee, God blessed them. Do you know that? God blessed them. Their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. What kind of clothes were they? Their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. God fed them. He blessed them. Amen. But all God was doing was waiting for them to die. But he was blessing them. Don't, don't misinterpret blessing. That may not mean you've got straight A's, as I said. And so he just blessed them and loved them enough to let them, you know, live out their lives and die. Because he needed a new crop. God's looking for a new crop that will go into the promised land. All of you that were in the, in the thing, I know some of them are taking care of different classes and stuff, but all of you that were in the shift Thursday and Friday, or one or the other, would you stand up and show these people how to thank God for a shift?
to the opportunity of crossing into the promised land. Moses is dead. Joshua is in charge. What's going to happen? What are they going to do? Are they going to balk again? Are they going to stumble again? They know there's giants over there. They heard the story all their lives from their dead parents who were there and wouldn't go. They knew all about it. Joshua gets direction from God. The priests take up the uh, Ark of the Covenant. They put their feet in the water. They commit. Ladies and gentlemen, there's times you just got to commit and trust God. When you can't see how the end is going to be, but you know God is leading you in that direction, you just got to put your feet in the water and trust God to part the water. Oh, I want to praise God. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. And so, or what are they going to do? The Bible says when that water was gone, they part went across. All of Israel went across on dry ground. They got into the shift. They shifted. And the first thing they came to was a walled city that God said he wanted them to have. And Joshua gave them strange instructions. Walk around this city once a day for six days, seven days, the last day. And when you hear the trumpet sound, shout with a voice of triumph. Because God is going to give you this city. And they did the ridiculous thing. They walked around once a day. And the sixth day, the seventh day, they walked around seven times. They didn't balk. There's another shift. Just do what I say, and you're going to see it come to pass. And they did, and they shouted, and the walls came down. How many of you believe, please raise your hand, that God owns you? Does he? Does he own you? Second Corinthians, or excuse me, First Corinthians six says, "What know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Does he own your body? It's a temple of the Holy Ghost, isn't it? Hello. Does it look like he wants it to look like? You know how he wants it to look like? How he made you." Or he made you different. What know you not your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Your choices are out of order. When you think you're in control and you're doing what you want to do, God doesn't own you. You don't seek his will and his purpose in your life? Am I making friends or am I making enemies here? I hope I'm making friends. The next verse in verse 20 says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your spirit is your attitude. Your body is your fleshly tabernacle. He said glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Who's getting the glory? John the Baptist. Inside the womb of Elizabeth, his first test. He's an embryo. Mary comes to say hello to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary is pregnant with Jesus. And they say hi. And Elizabeth says, Woo! Mary! The babe that was in me leaped when he heard you say your salutation. Man. John the Baptist. There's a good scripture against abortion. That child recognized the presence of God inside the womb of his mother. That doesn't sound like a law to me. That sounds like a person. And so she's saying, 
the baby leave. There was a responsiveness in the womb of Elizabeth because of who was in Mary. John in the womb recognized the deity of God was in the womb of Mary. He couldn't see him. He couldn't talk to him. He couldn't touch him. But he sensed it. And when he sensed it, he had to move. Because it was a shift. It was a shift in the womb of Elizabeth. John, are you going to be the man that I need? Are you going to be responsive to me? Are you going to be responsible to me? Let me see what you do when I get about five feet away from you. He could have said, you know what, this, this room is kind of crowded. I don't think I want to shout right now. There was something in John when he sensed the God of glory. Here's, this is my imitation of leaping in a womb. There's not much room in a womb. But he did the best he could. Ladies and gentlemen, God's not asking you to be Superman. He's asking you to just do what you can. What can you do? You can do something. You can do something. You can do something. You've got to get in the shift. What can you do? What can you sit there in the womb, raising, drinking iced tea? The king of glory is coming back. Tarshish. 
have illnesses. But Jesus Christ. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was a prophet killing ten city. He knew if he went to Nineveh, they were going to eat his lunch. He knew if he went to Nineveh, God said, go to Nineveh and tell him I'm going to kill him in three days. Whatever it was, I can't remember. And, and Jonah knew they weren't going to like that. And they were going to take it out on him. You know, sometimes God asks you to do things that you know are going to be hard. But Jonah forgot that the God that was telling him to go was the God that would be with him when he got there. That's what you've got to remember. When God is asking you to surrender, you know, we're going to have to probably, well, I'll save that for later. But, you know, when God calls you to do something, it may look like you can't do it. But don't forget the God that's calling you to do it is the God that's going to be there with you to help you do it. He's not going to ask you to do it by yourself. And he, 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 he freaked. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Hey, dumbbell, where do you go to get away from the presence of the Lord? There's nowhere to go. He's already there. You think you're hiding from him? You think he don't know where you're at? You think he said, well, I wonder where Jonah went. He must be hiding from the presence of the Lord. I can't find him. And he went down. Everybody say, he went down. Yeah. Say it again. He went down yeah. to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it. Everybody say, he went down into it. That's number two. He went down. Fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Verse four. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. He's now on the ship. God sends. When God's on your case, he's on your case, bro. And the Lord sent out a great wind of the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. The ship was like to be broken. And then the mariners were afraid. The people in the ship and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea and to lighten it to them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So he went down to Tarshish, down to the boat. Now he's in the boat, now he's down in the boat. He keeps going down. You see, when you miss your shifts, when you run away from your shifts, you ain't going up. You're not even going to stay where you are. You're headed down, 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 down. How far down are you willing to go? Your life turns into mush. Amen. He went down. He was fast asleep. He'd become so secure about running from God. He'd sleep and all of that. And then there were men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. He must have been bragging about it. What you doing here on this boat? I'm running from the presence of the Lord. I'm a genius. You know, people that are running from God always think they're outsmarting God and everybody else. You know how they're outsmarting themselves. You're making a fool of yourself. Y'all going to be back next week? I won't be preaching. <laughs> Yeah, come back tonight. I won't be preaching here tonight. Make your announcement. Tonight is, we're going to do it today, but we're going to do it tonight. Tonight we are unveiling one of the most greatest evangelistic opportunities that Christian Life Center has ever been a part of. We will be unveiling it, we will be blessing it, and we will be launching the concept, not in We'll be launching the theory, not in reality, but we'll be launching it tonight. It's and going to start in the new year. I will encourage every single person to be here. I have the same amount of time in between services as you have, and I'm going to be here. 
And I'm encouraging you to be here so that you can be a part and not miss the beginning of this shift. We're going to ordain some, some people, and it's going to be very, very important. We did it Friday, excuse me, Saturday. We revealed it to our senior leadership earlier and got their agreement, felt good. It seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost. And then uh, and Brother Wright was just thrilled with it. And uh, we unveiled it on Saturday. And tonight we're going to unveil it for you. It's probably the largest and most significant shift that this church has ever been a part of. He's not talking about just going to another building. It's part of we're shifting how we're doing ministry. It's going to be awesome. So please be back tonight. So, it's hungry night. Sunday night's for the hungry. Alright. So, verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said to them, why have you done this? I read that. Here we go. Two more pages. Count them. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now this guy is so stubborn that rather than repent, he chooses to be chucked into the water. Now if you're afraid of dying in Nineveh, why aren't you afraid of dying? And so he advised them to do that. And so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her anger raging. Whew. Now he's going down in the sea, down to Tarsus, down in the boat, down inside the boat. Now he's going down in the sea. Now the Lord hath had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. He's going down again in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Because after three days in a whale, the acids of the stomach of the whale destroy you. So now he's down in a whale. You see, when you have a little attitude, little attitudes don't stay little. A little bit of a missing shift because you're so proud. And you won't. Get with it because you have issues. It's just going to send you down. Get over whatever you got to get over so that you don't go down. God loves you. He wants you to go up, not down. And then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And you know what? He didn't pray on the first day. Man, this guy gets a blue ribbon for stubbornness. He didn't pray on the second day. He prayed finally on the third day. If I was God, I said, yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. Found somebody else. God is so good. Even if you're on day three of the whale, if you'll repent and be real, God will bring you out of the situation. Let's stand. That's, can't do any more than that. Heavenly 